that I think are, I've learned on the way and I feel are very important at any stage of your career. But the earlier you learn them, the better. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, you need to know your values and keep true to yourself. So I say this often to people, actually. You need to understand what's important for you. And mm. that way you can understand what you can and cannot compromise on. Mm. So, so life will ask you for compromise, okay? Yeah. It, I'm quite realistic about that. But when you know what you're compromising on and you're making a choice about that compromise, you're in control of that. Instead, if you don't know what you're compromising on, you don't know how much you're stretching your true self, and that might bring you somewhere where you really don't want to be. So it's really important to know what are the the core values and what I'm not like I'm not gonna let go like for example for me I I I wouldn't have gone to the US I knew that my family is in Italy I don't want to be too far away from there so I knew that geograph like that's a simple example there are more yeah. things about it transparency is really important to me so I, I want to work in a transpa transparent environment so there are things that each of us will have that are really important yeah. so I would encourage you to stop and think about it when you when you approach this science world because it can be quite it can push you around and it's important that you know who you are so that you know even if you're you can decide to be pushed that's fine but you are deciding it then keep an open mind very open mind <laughs> so you might have a very clear aim about what you want to do in your life that is important and you should pursue that, but you may get there in ways that you didn't expect, or you might end up somewhere else completely different that you didn't even think about, okay? So if you know your value, you know you, you, will, you will be able to travel on that journey by keeping an open mind. Um, so I, I did not expect to end up in genetic epidemiology when I started at all, but I'm enjoying it very much. And understand rejections. Everybody gets rejected at some point. Everybody gets a grant that is not funded, something like job applications that don't go through, PhD applications that don't go through, even more so. I mean, PhDs are quite harsh, actually. Um, but learn every time, ask for feedback, learn what you, what you can and just incorporate that and keep going. Like, don't let that push you. Just remain true to who you are and keep pushing, okay? There are so many opportunities out there that, one, you know, you will find yours. The other thing that is a bit less obvious is keep good contacts. So wherever you go, you will meet someone that might pop up back in your life 10 yeah. years down the line. Mm -hmm. They might review your grant. They might uh, invite you for a conference, talk. They might You might meet them again as a postdoc in a completely different place of the world. The, your, feel, your discipline is small. It's a small uh, environment. So yeah. keep good contacts. Whoever you meet, try to learn from them. Um, it's really important, I think. And then the last one is enjoy the journey. So the journey is bumpy. Um, you know, it's not necessarily easy, but keep your eyes open for opportunities and remember to have fun. And I mean this both personally and professionally. Do things you like, do them with passion. Let that paper kind of like surprise you. You know what I mean? Hello. Oh. So let things surprise you. Do that with you know, that kind of childhood curiosity, keep that alive because that is very easy to lose that and it's a shame. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, okay. So yeah, so that's that, those are things that I've learned on the way. Um, believe me, there have been tears at times in that journey. It's quite <laughs> normal. Uh, but I feel, I feel, like with time you get much better equipped to learn to, to manage that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Geoffrey. Yeah, okay. He's left. All right, yeah, please continue. 
so yeah, no, that's that's what I wanted to say about the journey. So I don't know if maybe this is a natural time to stop and if you or others have questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing this. And I, I can completely agree with you. I mean, I relate with everything that you have said, especially what is on your last slide. And I think it's important for people to, you know, take note of the of these things because they actually uh, happen and they actually assist or come to pass. So yeah, this is your opportunity to ask uh, Kiara <laughs> <laughs> uh, a question if you have any for her. Uh, you can also just type in the chat and then I can read it out if you can speak up. But feel free to speak up, just unmute. Uh, sorry, raise your hand and then I'll ask you to speak up so we don't have people clashing. Um, and I see Chisom here. <laughs> She's joined. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions for, for Dr. Kiara, just raise your hand and then uh, you can go ahead and ask. But yeah, in the meantime, uh, as you're waiting for people to ask, you've talked about, you know, passion and having fun while doing this science journey. So I'm particularly interested and keen about, you know, how have you personally, you know, stayed grounded and maintained, you know, both your, you know, passion for work and even passion for non-work, if I would say it that way. So like things that don't have to do with work and, you know, just yeah. ensuring that you stay engaged with that as well. Uh, so a little bit is luck, uh, as in I have been lucky enough in work to work with things I truly enjoy uh, I don't enjoy like 100% of every aspect of what I do there mm. are aspects that are not as enjoyable um, but nevertheless I am I, I'm so passionate about diversity in all mm -hmm. ways like from mm -hmm. linguistic diversity cultural diversity genetic diversity it's just something that really like whenever I see things that are different I'm like Ooh, what is that <laughs> so so that is part of and I love traveling yeah. so you know, all of that mix well together. But then we were talking about this when, when we first joined this meeting. Yeah. Um, I definitely overdid it when I was doing my PhD. Mm. So during my PhD, I, I kind of felt like, oh, the more I work, the, the more I will produce, the more, mm -hmm. I, the more I will advance, the quicker I will mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely don't think that anymore. Mm -hmm. um i do think that we all need rest we mm -hmm. all need downtime mm -hmm. uh how you choose to spend your down downtime is very much up to you but mm -hmm. um i find incredible joy in making things like i this can be food it can be crochet it can be sewing mm -hmm. it can be uh, anything really that well not not much more actually i'm not that skilled um and um I enjoy singing, I enjoy going for a walk. So I make sure that within my day, there is a little bit that I dedicate to something that makes me feel well. Mm -hmm. um, there is someone from South Africa who I collaborated with for a while who is called Richard Van Zyl Smith. And he wrote a very interesting little book that I'm gonna put the link in the chat in a second. And I think it's called something like the don't give Nobel prizes to that people. And it's about him having a nervous breakdown because he was working too much. Mm. And the whole point is about you can only really achieve success if mm -hmm. when you work, you're focused, you're energetic, you've got the full mm -hmm. self there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean working 12 hours a day. Yeah. yeah. That means working well the hours yeah. that you work. Yeah. And then recharge in the, yes. in the rest of time. This can be taking care of your family, to, you know whatever whatever yeah. makes you feel like a human being yeah. that's fine <laughs> you know um, and I think it's so important because I do feel that like it's like I come from southern Europe and I think there is a culture of overworking there is yeah. this kind of like if you're if you're an academic you need to be available yeah. any time of the day any time any day of the week and In it's Africa just like the same. not not really <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to I, I don't think you should yeah um so I'm very strict about separating things now. Yeah. Um, I think Chisholm knows this very well. Like I don't use WhatsApp for work. I don't use personal emails for work. Like it's all put in a place that I can choose to access if I need yeah. to on a Sunday. But 
I don't yeah. if I don't want it, it's there. <laughs> and I can be it, yeah. away. Hmm? Yeah. You're not touching it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To, yeah. So, just, yeah. so it's for, really important yeah. to learn that separation, yeah. I think, uh, early on. And honestly, it is a f I think it's you know, some scientists would tell you that that's mm -hmm. what you are expected to do. I'm very glad to see that, at least in the UK, there is a, a, a real change in research culture and yeah. a lot of people do not expect you to answer emails at odd times of the day or night. Uh, so there is a huge respect for your, you know, your your time pattern, really. Yeah. So it, also, it is also true, if you work best afternoon at night, and night, yeah, that, yeah. you know, that's also something that you can't Maximum, work with. Yeah. All yeah. I'm saying is that you can't just work continuously. Sure, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I know a lot of people might be interested, you know, in how do they join your team? Like, I mean, you said you're not a PI, but you supervise mm -hmm. students, right? So even yeah. in case they're interested in, you know, genetic epidemiology and would want to join your team at Leicester, University of Leicester, uh, what steps should they take? So, so as a PhD student, we have had, so we're kind of ending that now, but we have had a Welcome Trust funded program that in fact, was um, had two places per year that were reserved for people coming from low and middle income countries. That has been a fantastic opportunity, I think, for some students. Uh, but I would say in general, if you want to do a PhD in the UK with us or not, um, there are most of the PhD scholarships are actually for home students or European students, and that is a challenge. So identify the right scheme for you is really important. And I'm sorry, Chisholm, I keep mentioning you, but <laughs> but I think that that Chisholm's experience was quite a good one because she 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 did a split scholarship, a split Commonwealth, sorry, Commonwealth split PhD scholarship, I think it's called which is very good because it kind of brings together, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> kind of brings together both the PhD that you are doing maybe locally somewhere uh, in Africa and some of your time will be funded to be in an institution in the UK. So that is a very good way of bringing two things together. Um, Otherwise, you need to look into scholarships that are open to international students. Sadly, the UK has become very harsh on immigration policies, and I'm really sorry to bring this here, but I think it, I think people need to know there are fairly high visa costs to be a student in the UK. I mean, Ruth, you, you have the experience as well. I mean, it, it's not an easy journey and not all of it is supported by your scholarship so be prepared for that and the bureaucracy can be a bit annoying actually but nevertheless there are some opportunities that are open and um, yeah. I've also seen people coming supported by not so much from Africa maybe but from other parts of the world coming supported by local scholarships that would support mm. their study in the UK um charities can be another source of support mm -hmm. um so i don't know if that helps the other thing is that after your phd there are also other opportunities so while phd scholarships might be might much more dedicated to home or european students postdocs are not as much mm -hmm. so yeah and and the only suggestion I would give is make sure that you can demonstrate skills. This can be with, I mean, publications are great evidence, but not always an opportunity. But if you are in bioinformatics, having a GitHub repository that you can share with people so they can look at the way you code and what you've coded about. So be open about, so often it's not enough to say that you can do something you yeah. tr should try and show it it's hard because sometimes it's, you can't but yes sorry i'll stop francis
Francis, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Shara, for sharing your journey. And it's very inspiring to us. And some of us can identify with that. Maybe you can just share with us, uh, and for the sake of the many young upcoming scientists on this, uh, one, uh, two things. Uh, what do you call success? When, when, <laughs> when, do you, when do you count yourself successful? What do you call success in academia, mm -hmm. in research, in science? Uh, 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 and number two is uh, uh, how do you handle failure? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you ever fail, maybe you've never failed in, in something, but how do you handle failure? Uh, you talked of uh, uh, applying for a grant that you scored very highly yeah. and uh, it is rejected all the same. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter how good they, you know, ho however uh, benevolent or consoling the language of the funder is, at the end of the day, you have missed it. You have missed it yeah. and wanted it so bad. Yeah. So how do you handle that? Because that that's usually a deal breaker, especially for those of us in the uh, low and middle income countries, because... Uh, there the, are the very few uh, sources of grants, for example, and uh, when you think you have it and uh, uh, you have just reached there, then you are rejected, then some people just say, ah, to hell with all this thing, uh, I'd rather even go in business or something. Yeah. So how do you handle that and how do you stick on uh, despite the 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 hiccups that you get on the journey. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the first question was about how you define success. Um, yeah. So that's a hard one. So um, I think I think the way I would I would answer that is that there is a way in which academia defines success. And it's often very metrics based. So it's very much about how many papers you've got, how many grants you've got. Um, is effectively what you, you probably see about successful people that have got large research teams, a lot of research grant money. So it's very much about accumulating measurable elements of success, right? Uh, and of course, it can be also prices that you win along the way um, with the final golden dream of a Nobel Prize, you know, like that, that is kind of very objective measures of success. Now, if you ask me how I define my success, it's often quite far away from that. Um, I feel very successful when I shift someone's way of thinking like to me like there is a huge reward in the training I do in the outreach I do like when someone kind of gets illuminated and inspired that to me is like that is the success of the future isn't it so maybe that's why I'm not quite cut to be <laughs> an academic a real academic um but I I take huge satisfaction from that and that I've learned on the way that to me, supervision, training, all these elements of my work are really, really important. So uh, I also am very happy when I get a successful job application and a grant and a fellowship, don't get me wrong, and an accepted paper. I'm very happy with that. <laughs> so, so that's also success. On failure, um, uh, I haven't always dealt with it very well. <laughs> like when when my Marie Curie got rejected, I think I cried for a whole weekend. Uh, that was probably the worst time um, because I felt so sure that I would go in. But um, but nevertheless, on other occasions where things didn't work, um, I very much tried to focus on what I could learn out of it. Now, 
Okay, sorry, there is something about it that I wanted to say. So what really helped in in learn in dealing with rejections is understanding other people's rejections and the extent of that. Like you'd be surprised to hear how many pe- how many successful people have got rejected grants and how many of them before they got one that was approved. So it really helps to see that really is an integral part of the job. And my suggestion is apply for 10 places if you can. You know, if you find 10 things that are interesting to you, apply for them all. Maybe one will go in. And that is success, isn't it? At the end of the day, that the, all you need is that one you like is successful. And if you're lucky enough that you get two, then you can choose. But, you know, so... So I would say, as always ask for feedback if you can, see what the reviewers had to say, Be also be critical about it. Like I have received the reviewers that were just like, honestly, it felt like they had a bad day. Like they said things that I'm like, I can't even, you know, I can't even understand if you read what I wrote. Um, yeah. so, so remember, we're all humans. Some of it is a lot, some of it is luck right there are a lot of people applying for things so just keep in mind that it's not just you and I think that really helps getting you out of the like oh I am terrible it's all my fault (laughs) so yeah I hope that helps I'm happy to stay a few minutes later if you want and take Henry's question yeah yeah sure uh Henry do you want to go ahead Henry can you hear us Okay, yeah, just please speak up when you can hear us. In the meantime, I think it would be unfair to end before giving you an opportunity to speak about the art and science mm. aspect of things that you do, uh, community engagement. So you could probably highlight that after Henry's question. Henry, we can hear you yeah. now. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Kiera. Um, I, I, I learned some little Spanish, so I... But anyways, uh, my question was, um, in addition to what my mentor said, uh, Dr. Francis, about how to handle um, success and failure, um, for me, I'm, 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 I'm a young enthusiast, but my interest is in cancer research. So maybe my question was, um, how do you handle pressure in, in terms mm. of workload? And how do you balance between um, the academic, the professional, the, uh, the professional field, and your personal life? Because mm. so, yeah. yeah. So you know what? I, I've I've had this conversation with my own boss uh, some time ago. I said to him like, how I'm 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 kind of struggling to in terms of time management, right? So time management is really key in managing workload, I think. And uh uh and, and I'm that kind of person that struggles to say no as well. So so learning to say no is very useful. Like sometimes you have just to say no, I haven't got the capacity. Like understand your capacity and understand and, and don't And try and learn when is the time to say, okay, I cannot do this now. Can this wait three months and then I can do it properly? Like me with this talk. Like I think Ruth asked me to do it in May, but I couldn't do it in May. I would have been a stressed person without time and rushing away. So learn when to give time to to the things you like. Uh, Although sometimes workload is not about what we like. It's about there are also things that we don't like and we need to do. And he told me that he met someone in a leadership course, okay? So I was asking me, how do, how do you deal with doing both the things you like and the things you don't like, okay? And he told me that he, found, he had this interesting conversation with someone. And what they did was having two jars, okay? And they would put little notes in it. One was the jar of things they liked and one was the jars of things they didn't like. And what they did was like making sure that every day they picked one from each and did them both. Okay. Or did they something Mm. towards getting them both so that you never feel that you're going to have entire week of things you don't Mm. like. Mm. Okay. (laughs) Because that can be very demotivating. Now I didn't pick that properly, but what I do do is having to do lists 
And I force some time, I force myself sometimes to do things I don't particularly enjoy, but I know they are important and I need to do them. And I try to do them as quickly as I can, but also focused so I don't have to redo them because I didn't do them well. Okay. So it's that kind of like give them the right energy, give them the right space. Sometimes I book things in my calendar for myself, for example, so that other people cannot put meetings in there. Like yeah. it looks like I'm busy, <laughs> but maybe I'm just like reading things or, you know, like if you need to read applications or essays and that kind of thing, that takes a long time. So, yeah. And also every every week I start the week by like, what do I need to do this week? what I would like to achieve this week and then what time do I have free to do this stuff because you end up in a lot of meetings and things and you haven't got the actual time to do the work. So just about every week at, on the Monday, I evaluate, okay, when am I going to do these things? Like I need to do a set, like I need to do some coding. I can't do it half an hour here, half an hour there. So I need to find enough time to do that. And then I kind of, in my mind, that's the time in which I'm doing it. So, yeah, it, sometimes it gets a bit crazy, though, and then you have to just surf through <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and hope yeah. to get on the other side. Balancing personal life is just making sure you defend a boundary. Just have it, like, yeah. let that personal life take over sometimes, and that's okay. And don't feel guilty. You you you, you deserve it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think you can just... Um wind up by just you know speaking about the art and science project sure then we can wrap up yeah so i'm just gonna in the meantime in the background i'm gonna play something as i speak okay. uh it's gonna it's not gonna take very long don't worry okay where is it uh okay can you see that yeah, you can see it, yeah. So, yeah, so this is, so as I said, I really like uh, having people, like, informing, informing, maybe that's the right word. Yeah. Uh, so we paired up with an artist in the last couple of years, and in fact, this morning we actually ran our first big community event and that was that was very successful if yeah. you ask me yeah. <laughs> um a very engaged group of people Tamara is on the call joined us as well so it's nice to see several people from the team being involved and um we have decided to try and use art to speak about genomics and to mm. speak about representation bias Mm. So this work was done by Vishal Joshi, who is an artist here, and we worked with black communities in Leicester. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, uh, so he drew, designed the sculpture, the digital sculpture, and then the community members brought patterns and flags from wow. the places where they were from, and we made this skin layer that was applied on top. And his vision about the skin layer is very much about when he understood how little genetics mm -hmm. is behind skin color, mm. he was shocked by that. And he really wanted to like um, having the skin to speak about the togetherness and uniqueness of each human beings rather mm. than being an element of division, basically. Mm. And so, yeah, so we made this last year and now we have a quiz that we have developed based on genomics mm -hmm. that is about you know various things about dna and genes and chromosomes and whatnot and uh and it does stimulate a lot of interesting discussions with people and we hope that i really hope that by informing people they can make more more informed choices when it comes to mm -hmm. participate in genomic studies 